Thank you for joining us and welcome to this edition of Liz Collin Reports, a place for truth and meaningful Minnesota conversations. On the podcast, former Minnesota Congressman and conservative radio host Jason Lewis is here to talk about his new book, Party Animal, the truth about President Trump, power politics and the partisan press. Thanks so much for joining me today remotely, Jason. I know you're enjoying a little time up north. Yeah, yeah. Great to be with you, Liz, as always. I know there are a lot of P's in the title of your book, so that gets our attention right away. But I want to start with a different one off the top here, and that is prediction. With the midterms about 100 days away, what is your prediction uh, here in Minnesota and across the country? Well, I think it looks good for the Republicans. I think a number of swing seats ought to go our way, just the opposite of 2018, the first midterm of a new presidency that I was a victim of. But it's looking good. But my fear is that if you just try to ride the, the red wave without telling people what you plan to do and, and getting getting bold, then A, um, the Democrats aren't going to roll over. And obviously the media in Minnesota are going to do everything they can to elect Democrats. So it won't be that easy. And B, if you don't have an agenda when you get elected, if you just ride a wave, then it's going to be doubly difficult to do anything. And I think part of the what I said in the book, Party Animal, about the, the consultancy class in politics is they're telling candidates, don't say anything, just ride the wave, you'll be great. But if you're afraid to say anything on the campaign trail for fear you might alienate somebody, you'll never vote for it. That's going to really get the animal spirits going, right? So I, I think it looks good. I think they ought to take back the house. But my only concern is, okay, have you set the template so you can actually take bold action once you get in control of at least one chamber? I imagine the timing of your book may have played a part here with the, the midterms coming up, too. But take us back to, to your journey in, in writing this. Why is this something you wanted to do? Well, as a commentator for you know, 20, 25 years, I had my own uh, predilections about what Washington was like. But I never dreamed it was as bad as I thought. Um, and, and once I got there and I saw the swamp, and once I went through a campaign where all of the chaos we have today originated in 2015 and 2016 with the resistance groups, with Indivisible, they were, you know, crashing town halls. Um, Steve Scalise got shot in my first year in Congress. Um, people were being driven off the road. Republican candidates attacked. And here we are uh, this last weekend with Lee Zeldin, my former colleague up in New York, being attacked. All of that started in 2015 and 2016 and when I went to Washington with President Trump. And it really set the groundwork for the chaos we have today. And nobody takes great pride in saying, I told you so, but I told you so. And so I wanted to get it down so people don't forget this. A, you get the history down, but B, you can't forget it going forward. George Santayana, the famous poet, said, those who fail to repeat or remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And so I knew that, that quite frankly, the mainstream press was not going to accurately account for what happened so I wanted to. And I, I did so from a bird's eye view. And uh, here we are. And in a way, you said you wanted to set the record straight also about then President Donald Trump and your experience uh, with the president. But talk a little more about that. Yeah, I found a magnanimous chief executive who was willing to extend the olive branch to anybody. He was the guy that wrote The Art of a Deal. He wanted to be this sort of middle of the road candidate. He was not a dyed in the wool conservative, as everybody remembers in 15 and 16. He was opposed by more traditional conservatives. So the caricature that they painted of him was totally off base um, politically and personally, the man I met and then campaigned with and worked with in the administration. It was very magnanimous. And but but I have to say, He's from New York, right? So once they slapped his hand after he extended it, he wasn't going to sit back. He fought back. And when he fought back, he saw just the lengths they would go to to destroy someone. And I have to say, Liz, and I've got this in the book, it wasn't the Trump idiosyncrasies. And he was an unusual president, unusual candidate that got the press working or, or worked up, I should say. It was his policies, like controlling the border, taking on China, finally doing something about about you know immigration and and um, this this supply chain crisis we now find ourselves in, um, that was the the things and, and globalism and the, the endless wars and th those sorts of things that the swamp just couldn't countenance. They were they were not going to sit back and let someone disrupt the establishment. And that's when they really went after him. And boy, did they go after him! I mean, they went after him with a you know. There's a lot of talk on the J6 committee now about assaults on democracy. The greatest assault on democracy in my lifetime 
was the conspiracy between the DNC and Hillary Clinton and Perkins Coy and Fusion GPS and a false Russian dossier used to get warrants to spy on an opposing camp in a secret court. Now, now that's right out of Venezuela. That's right out of a third world despot. And I saw it up close and personal. And so I wanted to document that. And I've got a chapter in the book called From Russia with Love. And that's what it's about. You're right, though. We did see that again and again. It was really feelings over facts uh, during during that time in office. But what do you think, looking ahead to 2024, um, what have you heard? Do you think President Trump will run again? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've heard that he wants to, but there are a lot of things that can happen. It's a year off and a lot of things can happen between now and then or now and early next year. Um, we'll see. But I do think that that the, the America first agenda has now sort of overtaken the GOP. And I think that's a good thing. Um, what, what You know, Trump, for all his idiosyncrasies, as I say, he brought the Republican Party kicking and screaming into issues they were putting off with a more comfortable conservatism for years and years and years. And it's, you know, whether it's the pro-life agenda and Supreme Court nominees, as I say, taking on China and draining the swamp and controlling the border, those are issues Republicans weren't too eager to tackle. I mean, they, they, they love tax cuts and who doesn't, right? So do I. I've been pushing them for many years, but that's not going to fix the border. That's not going to fix China. Um, that's not going to do the things that Trump was really doing to take on the globalists and the globalists in both parties. Bringing it closer to home, back to Minnesota again, Politico identified Dakota County as deciding one of the most competitive house races in all of the country. Situation you know well, but what do you think this time around in the second district? Can Tyler Kistner beat Angie Craig? Well, sure. I mean, I think the swing districts are up for grab, and I think that's a perfect one to take. Um, but I think you got to be bold, and I think you got to go after Angie. And, and frankly, uh, I've got a, a nice, nice narrative in the book about Ms. Craig, who promised to be this middle of the road candidate. And the first thing she did was vote for Nancy Pelosi, then vote to impeach President Trump. It's actually astounding. Everything we warned about in 2018, speaking of midterms, uh, that that if the Democrats took control of the House in 2018, the, the Trump agenda would pretty much be on hold until the next election, right? And then we would have massive spending. We would have inflation because of that. We would have chaos in the streets. We'd have rioting. We'd have an out of control border. Um, we'd have censorship. We'd have lockdowns. Any of this sound familiar? I mean, you know, again, I, I didn't think it would happen this quick, but it's all happened. And I don't know of any Minnesotan that can say they're better off today than they were in 2017, 2018 and 2019 when our agenda controlled Washington. I know you write quite a bit about the partisan press, as you call it in the book. I have a few stories of my own on that topic. But what message is it that you want your readers to take away about your experience? Well, the single biggest development, probably in my adult lifetime, and this is probably the driving force for Party Animal, was the weaponization of our institutions. Um, we've had chaos in America. You go back to the 1960s. But you never weaponize the bowels of the DOJ for one party. You never weaponize corporate America for one party. And for heaven's sakes, you've never had a press so weaponized to do the bidding of one party than we do right now. And I had my own run-ins with CNN. That's documented in the book. But really, from day one, they were an arm of the Democrat Party. And frankly, um, they're all big corporations. That's why they call them leg legacy media. If they're making in-kind contributions to Democrats, which they're doing, if they're coordinating with Democrats as corporations, um, they ought to be reporting that on, to the FEC, for heaven's sakes. Um, this is out of control right now. And I don't have to tell you all the lies. Ask Kyle Rittenhouse. Ask Nicholas Sandman. Ask all of the people that were besmirched in the false Russian dossier, which engulfed this country for uh, two years, for heaven's sakes. Now we come to find out it was a total fabrication. A Strzok and Page plotting within the FBI to bring down a president. Um, this is stuff that, you know, Hollywood might write, but you never thought you, it would happen. And so um, the press covering for that and Hunter Biden's laptop and regurgitating. For, I'll give you a personal example that's in the book. I went through 2015, 2016 being massively outraised by Angie Craig. And she was the favorite and human rights campaign and the Democratic National Committee, obviously, and corporate America and the medical device manufacturers. Corporate Minnesota has gone totally woke. Let's be blunt about this, folks. And they were all in. So she was outspending me three, four, five to one. 
all during that 2016 campaign. It was all about what Jason Lewis talk radio host said. Oh my gosh, they're trying to bring up, they're trying to criminalize speech as though that disqualified somebody. And so two years later, I win in 2016 in an upset. Two years later, CNN comes out rehashing the same garbage in July through October of a midterm election year. And then when they asked why, they said, well, it kind of flew under the radar screen in 2016. Mm -hmm. It was all over 2016. So they are plotting almost on a daily basis. Give me another example. BuzzFeed um, publishes the, the false Russian dossier. And this is how the echo chambers, another chapter in the book, work. They, they basically out the false Russian dossier. They leak it. Then CNN says, well, now it's out. It's online. We can report it. And that's how they work. And it's basically, a, 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 well, it's a legacy of smears. Uh, that's really what the media are right now. And until real conservatives, not, not even conservatives, but journalists stand up and say, you know, this isn't right. I'm leaving or I'm going to call out my own newsroom. It's not going to change. Yeah, and I always say it's not so much what the media is telling you about a certain topic. It's really what they aren't. And that uh, happened again and again where, where well, I worked. Hunter Biden's before. laptop would have been right. exposed in 2020. I might be a senator and working with President Trump right now. I also encourage folks to follow you on social media. You're up on all the, the topics, but I know you've recently posted about the economy. Of course, the top issue uh, for folks these days from prices of groceries to, right. to what we're paying at the gas pumps. But what do you think? Are we in a recession? Well, not according to the Biden administration. No longer two negative GDP quarters make a recession. They're going to redefine that. This is projection at, an, at a level I've never seen in my life. Um, I mean, this, the sky is actually green, not blue. And if you repeat it long enough, people finally go, OK, all right. I don't want to you know, be step out of bounds. And that's a sort of censorious intimidation that they've been working on, just trying to scare people into falling into place. But look, um, and, and let, let me be bipartisan about this. Through the Bush Obama years, when we were growing at one percent, they all said, Big growth isn't possible anymore. We're stuck in this Japanese style malaise and Bush had his rebates. Then Obama had stimulus after stimulus. I've got a chapter in the book called The Cure is Worse Than the Disease. And that's about all of the money we spent. When I was on the budget committee in Washington, our, our annual budget was around $4.1 trillion. Now it's almost six and a half, seven trillion dollars $7 You spend all that money. They knew they could not tax that much without throwing the economy into a depression. The money wasn't there. They couldn't borrow that much without 20% interest rates. So they had the Fed monetize the debt. They printed the money. And when you do that, as Milton Friedman taught us so many years ago, what follows? Uh, inflation. But what's interesting is this, and I always I call the president this um, with all due respect, but Joe Biden is Jimmy Carter with a mean streak. You get stagflation now because you've got the foot on the brake with this onerous regulatory policy, no energy independence. They're re-regulating small business and they're threatening to raise taxes. But then you've got the foot on the gas with easy money. That is almost a standard recipe for stagflation, inflation without growth. Guess where we are? Now, juxtapose that, Liz, to where we left the economy. We did the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. We did 16 continuing review authorizations. Um, that is something where you go back and undo previous regulations. We deregulated about $4 billion worth. We, as I say, we reformed taxes. We were growing over 3% when I left Congress. So, you know, as Obama famously said once, elections have consequences. And in Minnesota, where crime is out of control, uh, stemming from 2020, uh, where the economy is, is teetering on the edge of recession, and where people are fleeing the Twin Cities, um, quicker than New York, um, they the consequences aren't so good right now. You've posted about that, about crime, the defunding of police, where we're the home, sadly, to that. You say this isn't happenstance, though. This isn't a coincidence. Well, no, it isn't. I mean, when you do this, you're going to get more of it, right? This is like, this is the old supply side argument in economics. If you tax work savings and investment, you're going to get less of it. If you subsidize it or cut taxes, cut the penalty on work savings and investment, you're going to get more of it. If you if you cut regulations, those congressional review authorizations I spoke about, you're going to you're going to get capital back into the market. You're going to revive those animal spirits that get the economy going again. So we've got all of the incentives in a perverse mode right now. And nowhere is that more evident than law and order, than public safety. If you're telling people that you're not going to get prosecuted, we're going to let the guy that attacked Lee Zeldin go. Oh, we're going to we're going to 
bemoan the fact that 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 uh, tragically there was another police shooting. Nobody likes that. But the fellow was a, a continual perp. He had 20 convictions, but yet he's the martyr and the cops are the bad guys again. You're not going to get police that are going to stick their neck out. It, literally, you can't hire them anymore. So you've got carjackings. You've got movie theaters being shot up. you got fireworks going off like, like missiles everywhere. And people are wondering what happened. Well, ask Tina Smith. She's the one that called the protests righteous. And she's the one that said defund the police movement was was a warranted. Um, the Democrat Party own the mess we're in right now. It's just up to Republicans to point that out um, ad infinitum. Instead of, as I say, uh, coming full circle here, instead of just riding the red, red wave. Tell us what you're going to do so when you get elected, you can do it. From what you have heard in Washington and beyond, how has the view of Minnesota changed, would you say, huh. in the last couple of years? Well, I've got a, a chapter in the book. Um, I think it's called Who Lost Minnesota that starts out something like this. When I got to Washington, people would ask me, what's happening in beautiful Minnesota, Jason? And by the time I left, they said, what the hell happened to Minnesota, Jason? And that's really the transformation. Rarely have I seen a metropolitan area decline in such a rapid way. Um, and it's very, very sad. It's not the place my mother grew up. Uh, it's not the place I raised my family in the Twin Cities. And so people are moving to greater Minnesota. People are moving out of state. Um, frankly, had it not been for a miraculous last minute discovery of uh, a few hundred thousand people, we would have lost a congressional seat. The December estimates on the Census Bureau had us going from eight seats to seven. Then um, in reminiscent of 2020, miraculously, they found a bunch of folks. And who knows? They, they saved eight seats. But it's, it's not the same Minnesota. Uh, nobody's going to be on the cover of Time anytime soon saying the good life in Minnesota, I'm afraid. And that's really sad. Any more politics ahead for you then, we have to oh, ask? No, I'm enjoying the lake and, and uh, <laughs> writing my book. I mean, I, I really do think, you know, on this, on this particular book, Liz, I really do think it's something that needed to be documented because if it isn't documented, um, the gaslighting by the mainstream press and the Minnesota press, I, I don't want to let the Minnesota folks off the hook, um, will be such that um, it won't be remembered. Um, and so uh, I wanted to put it down on paper. And I think it's going to be validation for a lot of people. That, yeah, But now they'll have it documented. And, and uh, I, I feel strongly that people read this because people need to know the history and how we got here. When they were protesting on my lawn in 2017, I was telling folks, don't think it's just going to stick around here. It's going to be your place next. And now they're at the Supreme Court justices. Now there's carjackings in Maplewood uh, and all throughout the metro. Um, it's not something we didn't predict. And I, I just wish the press would ask Tina Smith if maybe she was wrong about encouraging all of this. Yeah, we know those protests well. They hit awful close to home for, for a lot of us in Minnesota. And, and That's frankly, right. we've given them a, a free pass at, at every turn. Yes. And you know that more than most. And I know our friends at Twin Cities News Talk have you on each Monday to go over things chapter by chapter. So that's another way uh, people can listen in. You bet. And let's go to Barnes & Noble. If they don't have it, ask them to order it. It's party animal. And it's all about where we were, how we got in the mess we're in and how to get out. Again, the book is called Party Animal, The Truth About President Trump, Power Politics and the Partisan Press. The Honorable Jason Lewis, thank you so much for joining me here today. Always a pleasure, Liz. Thank you. And that will do it for this episode of Liz Collin Reports. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify or any other podcast platform, and be sure to subscribe to Alpha News on our YouTube channel. We'll see you next time. <music>